Welcome, my name is Jeff Bartles, and my portion of the overall presentation will be exploring some tips and tricks. Specifically, we'll start out by looking at a collection of what I like to call Civil 3D Quick Tips. These are the type of workflows that you can accomplish in a minute or two. Next, I will show you a way that you can convert raster imagery into vector geometry. Think company logos. I like to consider this workflow to fall into the unnatural act category, and we'll see why here in a little bit. I will also show you a way that you can carry Civil 3D designs into the field using a smartphone or tablet such that you can walk around the site and know where you are geospatially within your design. We are going to jump right into the demonstration. I'm going to drop out of my PowerPoint and we'll flip over to Civil 3D. In the interest of full disclosure, let me mention that I am working in Civil 3D 2024. Having said that, everything that we look at today is going to work for you regardless of the version of Civil 3D that you may be using. On my screen, I have a portion of an intersection design. If I zoom in, you can see that I've been inserting some symbology for the lanes. I've got a right turn lane here and then a pair of left turn lanes. Let's drag this down a little bit. I'd like to show you the blocks that I'm using in this file. I'm going to type insert to bring up the block palette. And then in the palette, I'll make sure that the current drawing tab is selected. And then in the filter area, I'm going to type arrow because all of my directional symbols include that text in the name. I do this to show you that all of my directional symbology is right handed. So you may be wondering, how can you get a left turn lane if you actually don't have a left turn lane? Let me show you. I'm going to launch the copy command. And then I will copy this symbol from nearest to here. And we'll place one perpendicular here and then perpendicular here. I will then select these two symbols and I'll go over to the properties palette. Notice that they have an X, Y, and Z scale of 1. If you flip these numbers to negative, it will mirror the symbol. For example, I'm going to set the Y scale to negative 1. When I press Enter, you can see the difference on screen. And then I'm going to put this back for a second, and we'll look at the alternative. I'm going to set the X scale factor to negative 1. And when I press Enter, you can see how it mirrors across the other axis. Once again, we'll put this back. Negative 1 Y scale is what I need. There we go. I'll press escape to deselect. This technique works after the blocks have been inserted, or you can do it as you're inserting your symbols. As you can see in the palette right here, there's my X, Y, and Z scale. If I wanted to insert a left turn lane, for instance, I can simply change the Y scale to a negative one. I can click my symbol, and you can see that that gives me the left handed variation. So using a negative scale will mirror your blocks upon insertion. And this technique could be a great way to maybe minimize some of the directional symbology that you have in your templates. I'm going to close this palette and then we'll zoom out and we'll pan the drawing over. Right here, I have a painted island. I would like to hatch this island very similar to this island down here. To hatch the island, I'm going to come up to the draw panel and I'll launch the hatch command. And then I will click inside this shape and by default, it's hatching it using solid fill hatch. I'm going to choose ANSI 31, and then to make this hatch a little easier to see, we're going to assign a scale of 15. Let me press tab to accept that, and then I can adjust my angle if I want by simply dragging this back and forth. This looks good. I will then click the green check to close. Let's zoom in. So this hatch looks nice, but let's say that we have a requirement that the striping for this hatch be exactly five feet apart. Let's find out how far apart these lines are now. I'm going to type DIST for distance. And then I want to find the distance from nearest. And you can see that as I wave the cursor around over this hatch, Civil 3D doesn't recognize hatch when it comes to object snaps. That's actually by design. Did you know that we could turn that feature off momentarily if we want to? If I right click, I can come down to options. And in the options dialog box on the drafting tab right here, we'll find object snap options. I am going to remove this toggle from the ignore hatch objects. Let me click OK. Now it will see the hatch. I can go back to distance, then I can find a distance from nearest to here, perpendicular to here. And if we look at the command line, we can see those lines are 1.875 feet apart. I'm going to drag across those and I'll hit Control C to copy that value to my clipboard. Now let's resize this hatch. I'll do that by selecting the hatch, and then I'll come up to the ribbon tab and I'll click in the scale field. Did you know that in virtually every place in Civil 3D where you can enter a number, you can also enter an equation. And I'll type equals, open parenthesis, five, which is the distance I want, divided by control V, that's the 1.875, the measurement that it is. Let's do a close parenthesis, and then I'll multiply this by the original scale of 15. And then when I press Alt Enter, it will do the calculation. 
Now, remember when I said in virtually every instance where you put a number, it'll accept an equation? This is one of the places where it doesn't. Not a problem. I apologize. That was kind of anticlimactic there. I'm going to drag across this equation and I'll control C to copy that to my clipboard. When we're working in Hatch, if I go to the Options panel and click the arrow here in the lower right corner, this brings up the traditional Hatch dialog box. From here, I can put in my equation. And then when I press Alt Enter, it will calculate it. I can see that's a scale of 40. And when I click OK, I can see my hatch updates, and I can do a quick distance here from nearest to this edge, perpendicular to this one, and we can see that's exactly five feet. Now I'm going to put things back the way they were. I'm going to right click and we'll come back to options, and then I am going to choose to ignore hatch objects, which is what you want in most situations, but it is nice to know that you can turn that feature off if you need to. Okay, I'm going to close out of this drawing. I'm not going to save changes. In this file, I've got a proposed site plan for a fast food restaurant. This is our chicken and waffles data set that we've used for a couple of years. This drawing is geo-referenced. I know that because I can see the Bing imagery displaying here in the background. This is assigned to state plane coordinate system. As I move my cursor down here in the status bar, we can see that it's displaying in real time the X and Y location. Did you know that I can also have this display in Latin long? If I wanted to provide a lat long coordinate to somebody, maybe they'd like to find a location on this site using their phone, for instance, I can come down to the coordinates area and right click and I can flip this to geographic. Now, as I move around, it is showing me the lat long location of my cursor. In fact, I can take this even farther here at the command line. If I type geo lat long format, I can turn this on by changing it from zero to one. And when I press enter, now, as I move my cursor, I'm seeing lats and longs in degrees, minutes, seconds. All right. Once again, I'd like to put things back the way they were. Let's look at another shortcut. If you right click in model space, you'll find an option called recent input. So I don't have to retype geo lat long format. I can select it right here from the menu. I can set that back to zero and I'll press enter. And then I can right click on the coordinates and we'll flip this back to absolute to see X and Y. Okay, I don't need to see the aerial image here anymore. I'm going to go to the geolocation tab, and in the online map panel, we'll turn that off. And then I am going to select the layout that I have in this file. Notice that on my layout, I have a pair of viewports. One is set to 1 inch equals 20 feet, and then I've got another viewport that's kind of a detail of the storage area here on the east side of the building. This is set to 1 inch equals 5 feet. First thing I'd like to do is turn off or hide this viewport. If I hover over that viewport, I can see that it's on the wrong layer. It's on layer zero. I would like to put this on the viewport layer, which is already set to being frozen. To do that, I'm going to select the viewport, and then I'll go to the Home tab, and then we'll open the layer list. The viewport layer starts with the letter V. If I tap the letter V on my keyboard, it will take me to the first layer that starts with that letter. Each subsequent time that I tap V, it will cycle down and select the next layer, starting with that letter. Until I get to the viewports layer, which is what I want, I will press enter, which puts the viewport on that layer, which happens to be frozen. I will go ahead and close that dialog box. Now, let's say I would like to label the drive through lane. Since I'm not labeling Sybil 3D data, I'm going to take this opportunity to label the drive through using an annotative text object. Once again, remember that this viewport is set to 1 inch equals 20 feet. I'm going to jump back to model space. Note that my annotative scale is set to 1 inch equals 20 here as well. I'm going to go to the Annotate Ribbon tab. I do this to show you that I've created a text style for the label, and it is annotative. I'm going to create this label as single line text. Let me zoom in, and then I will click to place my label, and I'd like this to be parallel to the drive through lane. And then I will type drive through lane. I'll press Enter twice when I'm finished. If I hover over this label, you can see the annotative icon that shows me that this text is annotative to a particular scale. It's annotative to 20 scale. That's the scale that was current when it was created. That means it will only show up in a 20 scale viewport. As an example, let's jump back out to the layout. You can see that the label shows up here. It does not show up here. You cannot do this with a Sybil 3D label, not without jumping through a bunch of hoops with layers and things like that. Now, let's say that maybe I would like this label to show up in this viewport as well. All I have to do is add the 1 inch equals 5 foot scale to this annotative object. I'm going to jump back to model space. And then I will select my text. I'll come over to the properties palette. Right here I can see the annotative scale. I'm going to click to bring up the dialog box and I'll choose add. 
I would like to add 1 inch equals 5 feet. I'll click OK and OK. I'll press Escape when finished. This label now supports multiple scales. If I hover over it, we'll see the multiple icons there. If I select the label, we'll actually see the two variations. Did you know that if a label supports multiple scales, you can move each variation independent of the others? For example, if I click this grip, I can move the 20 scale version. Why? Because 20 scale is what's current in my drawing right now. I'm going to place this one here. If I want to move the 5 scale version, I'll press Escape to deselect, and then I will set my annotative scale to 5. I can then click the 5 scale version, and I'll click this grip, and I'll put it up here. I'll press Escape when finished. Let's go back to the plan view, and now we can see the same label displaying in both views. So I can move these variations independent of each other. I can also rotate them independent of each other. Maybe I would like to rotate this label so it follows the drive through lane a little bit better. I'm going to double click in this viewport, and then I am going to create a line segment here momentarily that represents the angle I would like that text. Let's select the line. I'll go over to the properties palette, and I can see this as an angle of 31 degrees. I'll press delete to take that out. If I select the five scale version, I can very easily do that because I'm within the five scale viewport. I can then come over to the properties palette and right here, I can adjust a rotation angle. Let's set that to 31. I'll press enter. And then I can position this where I like. And even though these labels act like individual text objects, they are still the same label. If I zoom in here and double click on this label, for instance, I could change this, we'll make it a little bit more formal. And then I will double click out and you can see how that label updated in both locations. Okay, can't do this with a Civil 3D label. In the event you're labeling things that are not based on Civil 3D data, the annotative text object can be a great way to go. Now let's look at how we can convert raster imagery into vector. I know a lot of firms that use a image for the company logo, like a JPEG or a PNG image, and they reference that into their title blocks. And that's a great way to go. One thing to consider is that reference becomes a maintenance item in the event the drawings are shipped to another stakeholder. If you don't include the referenced images, then when the stakeholder opens the drawing, they end up seeing a rectangle with the path to where that image used to be. If we could convert those raster images into vector or block, for instance, the logos could live in the drawing and we never have to worry about them getting left behind. I consider this workflow to be an unnatural act because I'm going to be doing the conversion with Adobe Illustrator. I'm going to come down and bring up Illustrator. Now, a lot of firms have Illustrator. It's a very feature-rich application. Fortunately, we only have to know about three commands. So very easy for us to jump in and do this, even if we've never touched Illustrator before. Let me show you. I am going to go to File, and then I'll choose Open. And then I'm going to select my JPEG image. This represents my company logo. We'll open that in the interface. And then I'm going to come over to the Toolbox and click the Zoom tool. And I will click a couple times on screen to zoom in on that logo. The tool I'm going to use to trace this is called Image Trace. To make sure that tool is visible on screen, I'm going to come up to the window pull down. And right here, I can see all of the palettes and tools available in Illustrator. From here, I will choose Image Trace. And then one more thing, I'm going to come back over to the toolbox, click the Select tool, and I will select my image. And pretty much that's it. Now we just have to dial up what we want within this dialog box. For the preset, I'm going to choose High Fidelity Photo. When I do, it's going to scan that image, and it's going to trace the edges and create all the hatch patterns and everything for me. Now, I don't see all the edges just yet. I'm going to come down to View, and I'm going to change that from Tracing Result to Tracing Result with Outlines. Now I can see the outlines. At this point, I can optimize the conversion. Right here, we can see the color threshold. This represents the sensitivity that it uses to trace the shapes. Currently, this is set to 85, which is a little high for this design. If I drag the slider down to 62, for instance, we'll see how it reprocesses the scan and retraces. And we can see that we really didn't lose anything with respect to the appearance of the logo. So I'm going to keep dragging this down. I'm going to drag it a little farther than I need to, maybe 16, just to show you what happens. If you drag this too far, you'll start seeing parts of your logo dropping out. So now I know I went too far. I'm going to drag this back up. I found that with this image, the sweet spot is right around 30. If I set it to 30, that gives me a nice representation of the logo. I have all of my shapes. At this point, I'm going to come over to the right side of the screen, and at the very bottom down here, there's an expand button. This will convert this into geometry. And then I can right-click on this group, 
and from here I will choose ungroup and then I'll click on screen by ungrouping it will convert each of these shapes into an individual entity if you wanted to get in and make some minor modifications in this case it's darn near perfect let me click outside that the only change that I want to make if you remember this was a JPEG image that was square if I click on the edge here we can see that square boundary I don't need that I'm going to press delete to remove it now I can simply save this as a DWG I'm going to come up to file and I'll come down to export export as and in the export dialog box under save as type I will choose Autodesk real DWG and I'll click export and then in the export options dialog box for the most part I'm just going to keep all the defaults you can see right here I can assign an AutoCAD version I'm going to keep 2018 I can change the scale if I want to I can set this from true color to specific colors I'm going to keep true color what this is going to do is it will export this as a drawing file and it will have hatch patterns that are assigned true colors so regardless of the pen table that you're using for your plots the logo will look just like it does here on screen okay I'm going to keep everything let me click OK and that's it the DWG file has been created let's go ahead and close Illustrator I'm not going to save changes and when we jump back over to Civil 3D I'm going to open that file I'll choose open I'll go into the images folder where that was saved here's the logo we just exported if I drag this over you can see this is only 292k so if I was to make a block out of this and then insert the block on multiple title blocks it would be very lightweight in the drawing I will select that file and click open we'll open this in the interface and then I'm going to zoom in on this and I can do a quick regen to clean up the arcs and you can see this looks fantastic to turn this into a block I'm going to type block because I'm horribly old-fashioned for the name I'll call it logo for right now pick point I'm just going to arbitrarily pick a point here in the middle you can be much more specific on your end select objects I will window all of these and I'll press enter and I'll click OK this is now a block symbol I would like to drag this into that title block we saw a second ago I'm going to do that by going to the view ribbon tab and then from here I'll choose tile vertically this allows us to view our drawing side by side such that we can drag contents back and forth when you do this sometimes the start tab will want to participate I really don't need the start tab so I'm going to minimize that and I'll click tile vertically again to kind of eliminate that from the equation here I've got my logo on one side I'd like to drag it into this drawing I will click to select the logo and then once it's selected I will click and hold which kind of copies it to my cursor I can then drag this into another drawing and then I can close this file no need to save changes we will maximize this one and if I zoom in you can see I've got a nice lightweight version of that JPEG image that I never have to worry about being left behind if I send this file to another stakeholder okay let's jump over to model space Finally, I'd like to show you how you can carry a civil 3D design out into the field such that you can carry it around on a mobile device and know where you are geospatially within your design. We can do this using a combination of Autodesk Docs, the Autodesk Construction Cloud app, and Google Earth. At the risk of destroying the end of the movie here, the means by which we'll be displaying this drawing in the field will be Google Earth. And Google Earth doesn't understand civil 3D objects. So we'll need to dumb this file down a little bit to make it easier for Google Earth to display since we're going to do that I'm going to type save as once again old-fashioned and I'll add the word temp as a suffix to this file name this way I can do anything I want to this file and I don't have to worry about damaging the original once I've created my temp file I will ask myself when I'm out in the field is there anything about this file that I don't need to see well I don't need to see the contours so I'm going to select the existing ground surface and the proposed surface I'll come over to the properties palette and we'll give them a style of no display just to hide those from view I also would like to just carry a single file out into the field this drawing happens to have an external reference associated with it I'm going to select that XREF and then I'll right click and I'll come down to bind and then I'll select bind to insert that geometry into the file I will then choose explode and I will explode that bound XREF if you've ever bound an XREF before you know it becomes a block so now these are individual entities in this file you can see I've got a feature line here here I've got a structure this is a pipe object okay these are still civil 3d objects so I need to convert these to vanilla AutoCAD entities to make them easier for Google Earth to understand to do that I will type export to AutoCAD and then I'll keep the default name you can see it's going to add an ACAD prefix to the file name let's click Save 
That just exported my drawing to AutoCAD Entities. Let's open it and take a look. I'll go to Open. We'll select that file that was just exported, and I'll click Open. Perfect. If I was to hover over an object here, I can see this is not a pipe anymore. Now it's a line. The structure is now a block. This feature line is now a 3D polyline. I want to do one more thing before I export this to the field. I am going to select all of these entities, and I'm going to come over to the Properties palette, and we will give them a line weight of 0.05 millimeters. I do this because Google Earth is going to honor this line weight when it's displayed within the application. Since this geometry will be displayed on top of an aerial photo, it'll make this easier to see. Okay, to export this into the field, I'm going to go to the Toolbox tab, and under Miscellaneous Utilities, we'll choose Export KML, and then I'm going to keep the default name, no need for a description or hyperlink. Let me click Next. What objects do I want to export? I'll choose Selected Objects, and then I'll click the button, and I will select all of these. I'll press Enter. I don't want to export any text or object information or materials, so I'm going to uncheck these. Let's click Next. This drawing is georeferenced. I'm going to export it using the coordinate system already assigned to the drawing. Let me click Next. Here I can nudge the elevation. All the geometry in here is based on survey data, so I don't want to do that. What I do want to do is I would like to drape the objects onto the ground. I don't know what surface is being used in Google Earth. This will just ensure that my geometry is draped on top of their surface. Let's click Next. Here's where I can save the file. I'm going to click the ellipsis button, and I would like to save this to my construction cloud project. I happen to have Desktop Connector loaded on my machine, so I'm going to go to the Autodesk Docs drive letter, and I'll select my account. I will then select my Chicken and Waffles cloud project, and then I will navigate to the folder where I'd like to store this. I'm going to put it in this Field Files folder, and then when I save the file, we have the option of saving it as a KML or a KMZ. I prefer KMZ. I've found that that works better for me. Let's click Save. And then I'll choose Export. This exports the file to Desktop Connector, which then pushes it to the cloud so it's ready for use in the field. If you'd like to view the export at this time, I can click the View button. If you have Google Earth on your machine, it will allow you to display that KMZ file. When this comes up, I wish I could say that it would take us right to that area. It kind of is, but we're floating out in the atmosphere here. If we look on the left side of the screen, you can see there's the KMZ. I'm going to click to expand this, and then I'll expand this model category. Here we can see the geometry that makes up that KMZ file. I'm simply going to double click on one of these, and it will zoom to that object and make it a little easier to find it on the globe. Once we find it, I can roll the mouse wheel forward to zoom in. I can then hold the wheel down and push forward to orbit this up. We'll pan this over. So there's the geometry within the Google Earth environment. But once again, remember, our goal is to carry this out in the field. So this kind of shows us on the desktop what it's going to look like. At this point, I, I wish I could demonstrate the walkthrough in the field live, but unfortunately, I'm not at this site currently. So if you'll indulge me, let me do this. I'm going to close Google Earth. I'm going to flip back to my PowerPoint. I did a walkthrough of this site carrying my smartphone, although we could do this with a tablet as well. And at the time I recorded the screen on my phone, I also was carrying a GoPro camera so that I would have both the screen on the phone and the real world in context. You can see that I've got the Autodesk Construction Cloud app loaded. It is in the lower right corner. To launch the app, I will tap on that to bring it up, and then I will select my project. I'll tap to open the Chicken and Waffles site plan project. And then once I get into that directory structure, I will then navigate to where I saved the KMZ. So under Field Files, there it is. I can then tap to open the KMZ, and when I do, it says, hey, we don't recognize this file, but if you want, you could tap on screen and we'll let you open it through the Construction Cloud app using another tool. Perfect. I'll tap on screen and then I'll swipe over and click More, and I will then tap Google Earth to use as my viewer. Now in Google Earth on the phone, it's going to work just like it does on the desktop. We're going to tap in the upper left corner, and then I'm going to tap on Projects, and right here I can see the contents of that KMZ file. And same as we did on the desktop, I'm going to tap on one of the entities so that I can zoom right to that entity on the globe. And then once it kind of focuses on that area, I can continue to pinch outward and center the view on screen. I can also swipe downward to close that menu at the bottom of the screen. And then lastly, I'm going to tap the locate button to find me on this site. And it only takes a second. You can see this is real time. At the time I recorded this, I was parked at the southwest corner of the site at the end of that frontage road. So now I'm going to zoom in a little bit more to make this easier to see. 
and then I can start walking. And as I'm walking in the site, you'll see that the icon on my phone is matching my position. Now, I'd, I'd like to, for this example, I'd like to walk down to the first proposed entrance. Rather than having you watch me walk at my typical pace, I've kind of sped things up here a little bit. So you can kind of imagine I'm jogging if you want to. Very easy for me to find that entrance because I can see it on the phone. I can walk down to that location in my design and then I can see how that corresponds to the real world. Having access to technology like this can make your site visits much more meaningful. I worked on a project once where a utility pole was missed and it wasn't discovered until we were getting ready for construction and it turned out the utility pole conflicted with an entrance to a proposed parking lot. Having access to a tool like this would make things like that much harder or much more difficult to happen because we could catch those earlier by doing a site visit. Here I walked to the drive through pickup window. Once again, very easy to know where I'm at within the design. I have to admit, while I was out there, I asked myself, I wonder how well this is locating me in the real world. If you look on the phone, you can see in the northwest corner, there's an existing sidewalk that terminates there. So I decided I would walk over to that sidewalk because ultimately when I get there, the blue dot should be at that same location. And you can see that as I approach the sidewalk, it is pretty much right on the money. If it's off, it's only off by about a foot or two. So this could be a great technique to carry your Civil 3D designs out in the field. You can push them right to the cloud through Desktop Connector, and then you can access them through the Construction Cloud app using Google Earth. Okay, we have looked at a lot of things today. First, we looked at a large collection of Civil 3D quick tips. I've listed them there on screen. If you'd like, you can hit the pause button and kind of review some of the things that we talked about. During this presentation, I also showed you a way that you can convert raster imagery into vector geometry. Using Illustrator, we can very easily convert our company logo into a block such that we don't have to worry about references anymore when we're sending files. I also showed you a way that you can carry your Civil 3D designs into the field simply by publishing that via KMZ through Desktop Connector to the cloud. And then we were able to open that through Google Earth using the Autodesk Construction Cloud app. If you're interested in more tips, tricks, and workflows like what we've seen today, please visit our blog. The URL is listed there at the bottom of the screen. Accessing the blog, you will find more than 500 how-to videos covering many of the civil infrastructure applications that Autodesk offers. On behalf of Jerry, Alan, and myself, I want to say thank you so much for attending our session today. We hope you found it to be valuable, and we look forward to seeing you guys again at our next presentation.